Hello and welcome to CC Saturdays. In today's session, we are discussing about refactoring monoliths to microservices, followed by a short hands-on demonstration. Joining me today is Neha Shah. Neha has worked in various capacities for over 10 years in automation and QA space for large-scale streaming uh, infrastructure. And she leads a prolific team of test engineers covering applications, microservices, and embedded devices. Neha also speaks uh, extensively at uh, tech meetups, and uh, she was a finalist in the coding category uh, at Women Tech Global Awards 2020. Uh, welcome, Neha, to the session. Over to you now. Uh, thanks for having me, Prasenjit. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join you and share my views and knowledge uh, with the community. So what are we up to? Uh, basically, we will talk about monoliths and how to break it down to microservice. So today, uh, there are two major types of software architectures, uh, monoliths and microservices. Microservices has become extremely popular in rec recent years. Um, that doesn't mean that monolith architecture isn't good. Uh, in fact, it is about the scalability that becomes the differentiator. Uh, so in this session, uh, we will be talking about uh, what each of these means, uh, how they functions, what are the pros and cons, and learn how monoliths are split into microservices. And then we will follow this up with a demonstration. So uh, let's uh, go to the next slide. Uh, so this is about what is monolithic architecture. Monolithic applications are uh, designed to handle multiple tasks. Uh, they are typically complex applications that encompass uh, several tightly coupled functions. Uh, for example, consider a monolithic e-commerce SaaS application. It might contain a web server, then maybe a load balancer, a catalog service that services up product images, an ordering system, maybe a payment function, and then a shipping component. So as you can imagine, given their broad scope, uh, monolithic tools tends to have a huge code basis. Making a small change in a single function uh, can require compiling and testing the entire platform, which goes against the agile approach. Uh, also, uh, if there is a failure in one of the function, then in the entire application may go down. In contrast to the monolith approach, a microservices architecture involves smaller application deployed independently and loosely coupled services tied together through the application integration. Uh, with microservices application, the business logic may encompass multiple platforms, including a software as a service, on-premises databases, and in-house developed application that meet the needs that no other SaaS application handles. Uh, from a software engineering perspective, microservices can be simpler to develop. They are smaller in scope and therefore smaller in sizes, which makes it easier for the developers to improve them uh, through continuous integration and continuous delivery. They can be written in any programming languages and they can communicate with each other uh, or each uh, or other microservices through APIs. An application programming language or APIs, what does that mean? It is a set of programming calls that exposes the functionality for an app of an application to developers. Uh, APIs makes it simpler to develop integrated application by offering an easy way to pass credentials and uh, data between applications. So the question might be, now why microservices? So among other things, they are first of all scalable, then they are manageable, uh, they are deliverable, and they are flexible. Uh, but how do we break the monolith to microservices then? So the answer to that is uh, an effective way to move your system to microservices architecture is to start with identifying your core services and then refactoring and decoupling them. Uh, now let's take a deeper look on how you can go about making these changes and review the best option for storing your application on the cloud. 
so the step one would be identifying your core services. Uh, it would be very useful to start your migration by identifying the critical services, uh, which may be the ones that brings more revenue to your business or the ones that are the mo most used by your customer base. Uh, these services will be the hardest to split from the monoliths. So that is what we need to keep in mind. Uh, the second step would be the decoupling and the refactoring part. So we have seen how we can split everything. But now the question is, how do we separate the services and everything from everything else and refactor them to, to become a bunch of microservices? So the first thing to know is the less communication, the better relations. It's very easy and tempting to create you know, lots of services that are very easy to test from a singular standpoint. But when you think of it as a whole, your system will get really complicated and tangled. So because of that, it will make things difficult to track. Uh, for example, if there is a problem which will arise because you have got this enormous entanglement and it may be hard to identify where the root of this problem lies. So another important consideration is to enter events in the queue. Uh, now, many times we have been told that we cannot break these into separate services because things has to be perfectly synchronized for events that happens you know, in the next step. Uh, usually, that's not true. Uh, thanks for the queuing system and the topic messaging systems that exists today. There are lots of ways to break the synchronization. It's true that you are adding an extra layer that could bring some latency problems. But in the end, being able to break all the synchronicity will probably end up in improving your experience. So the step three would be the API and the cloud. Now that we have done all the slicing and decoupled our code, where do we put all of these stuff? The answer is the cloud. So today, we have got plenty of solutions. Uh, to name a few of the most common ones, uh, we have the Google Cloud Platform, then we have Microsoft Azure and AWS. These are the three main contenders, but there are many more providers. Uh, these solutions usually provide out-of-the-box microservices architecture, where you just only have to draw some lines and do some small trainings and get things up and running. And you can even run microservices on premise using frameworks like uh, Spring Boot and then use Docker to containerize them. So I think uh, that was it basically from my side. Uh, maybe in the upcoming session, uh, we can discuss on how we can deploy, test, and monitor those microservices at a scale. So now I would like to uh, uh, move it to Prasenji, who will be demonstrating how a simple monolith is refactored into a microservice. It's time for a hands-on. So thank you, everyone. Over to you, Prasenji. Thanks, Neha. That was a nice session from you. And uh, we got to learn a lot about how microservices um, are bro broken down, how you can break a monolith and derive multiple microservices and how it goes on to be deployed. We can go on and cover in a more detailed fashion in uh, upcoming sessions. So I'll try to put up a small uh, hands-on demonstration of how a monolith works and how we can break it down into three or four small microservices and how we serve it through a, a public API gateway. So let's get started. Let me share my screen and let's get started with the hands-on. So uh, what do we know so far? We know that monolithic architecture is one which uh, in which applications are huge, which have millions of lines of code all together and uh, they connect to a very large database and there are disadvantages to this uh, that is uh, it takes uh, time to release new um, versions of this uh, product and uh, lots of people have to work together if something fails then you have to um, 
check the entire stack instead of uh, checking that particular component because many other things could fail because they are all working together so these are the problems so that's why we break the monolith into microservices so how do we do that for that uh, we have a repository here uh, github breaking monoliths repository so you can use that and clone it if you want to do it yourself so here i have a monolith application as well as uh, a microservice application which i have created by splitting those monoliths so you will see different folders for different applications now for the monolith application um, there are different modules we have a front end a payment module and the catalog all put together in one single uh, entity that's what a monolith is so they all work together and uh, while the microservices architecture is the one where each component each of the same components payment catalog and the front end are split into different units which can work independently and they are dockerized and um, uh, all the containers can run independently and are uh, connected together by api gateways so this folder the monolith folder consists of uh, a subfolder called app which has the code so this is a java code uh, so in the pom.xml you have all the dependency details and uh, uh, when we compile it using maven then we'll get a jar file which we can run uh, that that's what the monolith would be so you can see this monolith release jar so this is what i did when i compiled it but i'll show you from scratch like how do we compile a monolith and uh, how to go about it now this test.php is uh, the front end uh, application so i just created a simple php file that connects to the uh, back end uh, service the jar file the monolith service which runs on 8081 port and uh, then displays the application so this is a very simple application so you will see here the IP address uh, connecting to 8081. Um, so this is the IP address of my laptop. So if you try this out yourself, you will have to replace it with your IP address. And uh, this is where the backend monolith service will run and PHP will connect to it to um, uh, with REST APIs and to get the uh, information. Now, similarly, this microservices subfolder in the repository has a docker compose.yaml which orchestrates the entire uh, thing. So you have different components broken down into microservices like this payment module, uh, you have a front end module and uh, you have a catalog module. So all are separate and orchestrated by using this uh, particular um, microservice now you have different folders catalog front end and payment so all are bound together and here you can see the same diagram uh, where you can see different components running separately and there is a api gateway which manages the communication while in the monolith you have a single so let me copy the repository URL so that we can clone it and then uh, try to start the monolith application first. Once it is up, we'll break it down into microservice and try the microservice application and you will see there is no difference. So I do a git clone. will take some time and uh, once we get all the code into our laptop then we can go ahead with building that jar for the monolith and then we will um, run that jar as a docker container and then we'll have a front end up another um, uh, docker where we run the php and connect the front end to the monolith and see how it works so I'm entering into the repository folder and here you can see different subfolders monolith uh, 
microservice and prerequisites yeah uh, there's something i must mention in prerequisites there are certain um, uh, files and uh, there are certain uh, components that need to be installed for this entire demonstration to work so that is what the prerequisite contains and this is optional actually not needed for the monolith but for the microservice here you can um, run a docker compose up to get all those components uh, installed so these are basically grafana prometheus for collecting metrics uh, for collecting uh, logs and so on so that we can follow what is going on in the microservice so it's optional but better to install it so you can do this just by doing a docker compose up so i'll do just that and once we run the docker compose then we will have all the prerequisites installed in here so let me go ahead and run these docker containers now Well, one thing here uh, I would like to mention uh, in the prerequisites uh, directory itself, uh, you will see uh, that you have separate components Prometheus, Grafana, and then Zipkin. So, all these are necessary to monitor the microservices which we will run later. But for the monolith, you would normally not need it well, now back to the console so i'm going to run the prerequisite containers uh, docker compose up and i would put a hyphen d to keep it as a daemon on the background otherwise this becomes very chatty and it keeps on uh, printing everything on the screen all right, so that is done. Let's check Docker PS and we see that all the uh, containers are running, all the prerequisite containers, Grafana, Prometheus, Log Collector, Client, Server, all these are background services. Uh, we'll see that in a while. So that will be needed for the microservices part actually. And they're listening at different ports, for example, Grafana on 3000 and so on. So you can even check that out all the exposed ports and the urls are mentioned in the readme file in the repository so you can even check that out uh, in the repo so if you go to prerequisites and look at the readme you'll see all the container links and the port where they're running so the thing which we are looking for now is grafana dashboard so it listens at port 3000 and this is the link so if you click on it it opens grafana for you and you can then uh, you can then uh, log in and check it out also you have this prometheus running here uh, Prometheus will discover the service and uh, put it here uh, so you can see we have a mesh client and a mesh uh, server here we'll talk about what a mesh is in a while when we do microservices um, so I'm just logging in default password for Grafana is admin admin so use that to log in so there is no data here yet so as uh, the microservices run and data starts coming in this dashboard would be populated so you can just refresh at that time and see it well so that was about the prerequisites uh, so let's get back to the monolith directory and back to the terminal again and uh, we'll start compiling the monolith so in order to compile the monolith uh, we have our code base inside app directory so enter cd app and then you can see the pom.xml is there so we can use uh, maven clean install to install it you have the commands uh, in the readme file as well so you can just 
copy mvn clean install to build the jar so it will compile the java code and um, get an executable jar file of the monolith backend and then we will put that jar in docker container well um, uh, one thing to mention in the pom file you will also see a plugin that builds a docker container so we have a docker image ready as well and when you're doing this for the first time it will take some time well there are so many images in my laptop let me grab it out so this would be monolith and here it is um, this is just a release version and this is the name of the image so we have the docker image ready and here's the command to run the docker image docker run and you run uh, that monolith application on 8081 port so that's what i'm doing the docker container is up so we have our monolith backend up and running now next what we'll do we'll start up a, a front end and connect it to the backend well this is the monolith running at 8081 so it will be able to um, take in requests now if you get any error while building this docker image so just run a docker pull open jdk jre alpine image and then try uh, running this uh, monolith docker uh, or mvn clean install because that's something i had missed earlier all right so this command um, runs a lamp server where we'll place the um, php file which is actually the fronted to our monolith app so i just ran it and if you put in your laptop's ip address and test.php that will connect to the backend so here we have this monolith demo so this is nothing but a catalog and the prices so you have a catalog module a payment module and a front end all in one code so that same same code base is displaying the entire thing say you choose something and you buy it so it will show the total price there so this is just a simple demonstration of a monolith app but a real monolith would be much more complex and thousands of lines of code large database that sort of but this is just for the demonstration like how you have a single code base and uh, that compiles into a single jar file and uh, you do all these things catalog payment and uh, purchase on the single app now if you want to split it down you have to go to the microservices where you have a separate catalog module separate front end separate payment and all of them are running um, on separate docker files so you have a docker file for each of this and uh, they are running separately as uh, docker containers and they are bound together using um, a mesh a service mesh uh, that connects to different ports and uh, and then requests that come in are routed uh, in that way so that's how microservice framework works um, and now microservice architecture is uh, more complicated actually uh, it is tough it looks very easy at high level but implementing is not a very easy process but still it has its advantages its scalability um, ease of operation there is no uh, things are not dependent on each other everything is stateless so that is why it becomes uh, uh, i mean it is advantages when you are thinking of scaling up well let's get back to the microservices directory and here you will find a docker compose yaml again now let's run it up hyphen d and when we do a docker compose up here uh, it starts all the separate microservices at separate containers so docker ps and we'll find all the containers running well if you look at the container names column on the right uh, in the top you'll see microservices frontend is running catalog and payment is running and there are two other services which are the mesh uh, frontend mesh and the service center so these services uh, allow you to bind different microservices like 
they act as the API gateways. So the front end calls the API gateway and it detects where the REST API for payment is, where the REST API for catalog is, and that way it redirects the request there instead of being a single monolith that does the routing. And this Docker uh, Compose uh, becomes the orchestrator here and it orchestrates it. Now it listens at 8088. I was just checking which port the front end listens in. So if we go to 8088 and do a test.php, we'll find the front end. But this front end is different from uh, we had to do the test.php here. Well, this front end is different from the front end of the monolith. Why? Because here, though it looks similar, but in the back end, you are connecting to independent uh, back end services. Well, it works similar to uh, the other one. So I choose two uh, things from the catalog and I buy it and it shows the total price. So the functionality remains same, but we see architecture wise, this is different. Now, uh, these microservices involve a number of small, well-designed uh, microservices that exchange messages between themselves. And that is done using those API gateways. So if you look closely at the diagram, you will see separate components but bound together using the service mesh of the API gateways and there is a service center uh, which manages it. Now there are various frameworks which uh, allow you to create a microservice architecture like Java Spring Boot. You can do it uh, using a framework called Cricket and so on. So uh, that was about uh, the hands-on before going from monolith to microservices you must uh, know that it is not an easy switch and you should ask yourself uh, some whys like for example why do you want to be um, uh, moving uh, do you want to adopt new technologies and processes faster do you want faster release cycles or do you want to scale more easily so answer these whys and then only move ahead and there are some good practices also so the first thing you should remember is don't refactor everything all at once. It is impossible to do it, right? Uh, and uh, treat the monolith as a black box with some APIs. Um, they don't necessarily have to be RESTful APIs. Think of ways to interact with it. If you need to interact with the monolith, um, create a separate service uh, with the API you need. Y use only that API forward and when adding new features create separate microservices with an api for each of them uh, and have them interact with the monoliths api after some time uh, you will see that the pieces of your monolith are being accessed only through your new apis even though they are still a part of the monolith code base and uh, once you see the bounded context bubble up then it might be convenient to chop them off the monolith and have them working as a uh, separate service. Now with uh, microservices, you will need much more automation than before. Um, think in advance uh, about uh, CICD uh, and uh, where you're going to store your containers, uh, central logging, monitoring and all that. So these things have to be kept in mind and uh, we will have some follow up sessions after this where we will discuss how we manage these aspects when it comes to microservices like how we deploy, how um, Docker Compose doesn't work. This was a demo but how it doesn't work in production when you are scaling it to large numbers, how you deploy it to Kubernetes or some other orchestrator uh, in the cloud and uh, we'll discuss how we test microservices, how we find errors in them, how we, how do we trace it. So lots of things to follow. It was uh, a pleasure having this presentation 
and that was all from two of us if you like the session do let us know in the comments if you haven't joined our community of awesome cloud customer engineers and solution architects consider following the links in the description to join and subscribe to us and those who are interested to feature in a CC Saturday uh, and share something tech feel free to leave a comment or reach me in the community slack channel details are also there in the description thank you and stay safe